We're going to hear more about the education white paper. You're very keen to highlight the increase or likely increase in funding uh, returning to 2010 levels by 2024-25. Why do you think that's a success? Well, we had to come through uh, the financial crisis uh, and, of course, then the pandemic where we've put 400 billion to work to support jobs and uh, the economy to be able then in the spending review to um, have 7 billion being invested in uh, schools, in education, taking the, the total budget for schools alone to 56, over 56 billion. Um, so my total budget in the education department is 86 billion by 24, 25. Um, I think that's important, uh, which is why, and by the way, that 7 billion is front loaded. So 4 billion of it is uh, coming early. Uh, to make sure that we have the investment in our schools. Uh, teachers have done an excellent job to make sure that 99.9% .9 of schools um, uh, opened and remained open through Omicron. Um, so that investment is really important. Uh, it means, I hope, uh, we can uh, complete the journey, which is what my white paper does, um, of uh, a family of schools, which is all the evidence suggests that schools that work together in a family of schools that's tightly uh, managed, really well supported by a strong, and I underline strong, uh, high performing multi academy trust deliver better outcomes for the children. I'm very fond of talking about my background of being the 11 year old who couldn't speak a word of English, uh, but with parents who had the wherewithal to push me in and look where I am today. I want the system to work for every child, wherever they are, at the right place at the right time even with those whose parents don't have the wherewithal or have no parents. That's what the white paper will do. Um, okay. It's a real um, you know, ambitious target to make sure every school in our country is high performing in that family of uh, schools working together. So let's go back to why you say that um, there have been challenges on the budget. Of course, um, it's affected every department, but the health budget has increased by 42.4% by 2025 since 2010. The Department of Education only 2.8%. So there is the money there. So what the Chancellor's done, if you look at actually across government, and health has had a, a, a big uplift because of the pandemic. Clearly we had to deal, I was the the vaccine deployment minister in health at the time. Um, 40% more if on you, health and education. But education has also now uh, uh, caught up in, in the sense that we've got 7 billion going into schools. Uh, we've got 3.8 billion going into skills. You see on my lapel that TL, T yeah. levels. That's, Tory leader, uh, as we always say. Well, it, it's, it's actually a fusion between an A level and a, uh, t a, an apprenticeship. Uh, that is what a T level, and, and we will make them as famous as A levels. Um, over 80 um, universities now accept T-levels, or you can go straight into work as well. Um, so, look, the investment is there. Uh, the white paper outlines how we're going to get there. Uh, the first thing you've got to do, by the way, the most important thing, and the greatest predictor of outcomes, is a great teacher in the classroom. We're investing a quarter of a billion in half a million teacher training opportunities. So from the early careers framework to the initial teacher training to the later on in life sort of professional development, big investment in teaching. Uh, big uh, target to take, at the moment, only two-thirds of children complete primary school um, with the ability to read, write and do maths to an acceptable level. Two-thirds. That's not good enough. I want I to get that to... We only spend five grand a pupil on Well, that. I want to get that to 90%. 90% of We don't pupils. spend enough money. That's we are spending... So the OECD... I had Andreas Schleicher from the OECD in my office um, a couple of weeks ago. He said, on schools, you're right up there in terms of investment in education um, and compared to, you're what? In, compared to the other OECD countries, um, that's a good thing. Um, now, how that money I mean, spent sometimes you said that because sometimes the Netherlands came... consistently places higher than the UK in world education rankings. They've placed over six times the amount of catch up funding per pupil than the UK has. So I've got five billion, as well as seven billion, I've got five billion in catch up money. You remember when I was doing the vaccines? Yeah. Right? I wasn't interested in how many vaccines we had in the warehouse. I wanted to know how many we get them in people's arms. I've got five billion to spend on the national tutoring programme as part of that, getting those children with the least time left in education, the 16 to 19 year olds, uh, 800 million of that money, and of course focusing on disadvantaged children in primary and secondary. Let me get that money into the system, make sure that those students are getting that additional help, which they are. We've got a million blocks of uh, tutoring that have already been delivered. We're going to deliver another million by the end of this school year, six million in total by the end of this parliament. And I I'm, will always be data-driven, evidence-driven, I will evaluate and I'll look how far we've got. 
We're doing well on primary school reading and maths catch up. We, we need to do better at secondary. And I'll always go back for more. But let me actually get this right. It's no point having a sort of arms race. How much can I announce I'm spending? I've got to make sure it's actually working in the system. Scale is hard in anything you do. But having 10,000 academies already is great. I've got 22,000 schools in England. I want to complete that journey, but complete it with quality. Not you just need a, the money a... to do that. The catch-up czar, Sir Kevin Collins, um, he resigned, didn't he? Um, he said uh, the proposal that he presented to the government was for £15 billion worth of funding. Why do you think he resigned? Well, uh, there was clearly a, um, a, a disagreement as to uh, you know, the, the But the you're quantum. taking people on, you ask yes. him to, to be an expert, yes. and then he presents this report and you ignore him. No, no, this is... I have a lot of time for Kevin Collins. I worked with him, in fact, when I was Children and Families Minister in the department four years ago. Why do you think he um, resigned? But there was a disagreement over the, the, the quantum of investment. What I'm saying to you is I've got £7 billion, uh, going in to investment in schools. I've got £5 billion on recovery. Um, let me do this well, and I can demonstrate to Kevin Collins and the rest of the country how well we've done on catch-up. Tutoring used to be the privilege of fortunate parents, wealthier parents. It's now available to every parent. I want parents watching this programme this morning to ask their schools, are they participating in the National Tutoring Programme? Because we want to make sure that we deliver six million blocks of 15 hours of tutoring for children for it recovery. It comes down to the money, Minister. We have five billion, and I'm, I'm going to make sure... Fifteen billion I... is what the well, uh, catch-up czar says. With respect to uh, Kevin, I don't, I'm not interested in, in sort of announcing big numbers. I'm interested in how we're going to spend it to deliver you better outcomes. You say you're not interested in announcing big numbers, but we have the big numbers from the Chancellor saying that, you know, the big cheers in the House of Commons, we're going to take you back up to 2010 levels um, 14 years after we took power. So, look, the... the How is that successful? The, well, I tell you why. Because you've, we've had to come through a financial crisis. Um, if we hadn't taken the tough decisions then, we wouldn't be able to spend the 400 billion, 400 billion that the Chancellor spent uh, protecting jobs, protecting businesses, small businesses, um, making sure that 14 million people uh, had that net of protection through the furlough scheme. And, th and then we were hit by a global pandemic. You know, yeah, but other departments had that problem as well. And as I said, it's chump change what you get, what you're getting compared to the National Health Service. I hear what you say about them needing the money for the pandemic. Um, let's talk about kids in schools, though, mm. when it comes to food. Mm. You know, a lot of them need to have uh, a, a hot meal at school because that's the only time they get it. Half a million children are in absolute poverty. So I saw the Resolution Foundation yeah. uh, works, I think, what you're referring to. Um, what the Chancellor's done um, is earmarked 22 billion for this one year coming because of the... We're in a global battle, OK, against inflation. What does that mean? It means that your weekly shop is increasing, your utility bills are increasing. 22 billion for one year of help. Nine billion of it is going into helping people with energy costs. He's already announced that in February. We'll always review that. We'll look what, what more we can do. But part of that, this Friday, the um, national living wage will increase, which means yeah, people get £1,000 more. What, I mean, I'm sure that you'll be as appalled as I was to hear about a 14-year-old boy in Wandsworth who was in the queue at a food bank, collapsed through hunger and had to be taken to hospital. That, that, that's 21st century Britain, come on. Well, that's, I, I agree with you. That's heartbreaking, which is why I'm saying to you that the money, the £22 billion, I'm just trying to describe to you where it's going, yeah. right, £9 billion going towards energy, £1 billion, so the Chancellor in the um, spring statement doubled the amount going to local government. Your question about Wandsworth. Mm -hmm. Wandsworth will know where those families are that need the most help, the ones that you just described to me at the food bank, or the ones who are really struggling with their uh, utility bills. But you acknowledge billion, that should not happen. Uh, which, is why he's putting, which is why he doubled the amount going to local government, so they can help those people directly, uniquely, to be able to, to go to those households and say, look, there is help available for you. £22 billion in one year is a, you know, a big number, but we're not resting on our laurels. We're not saying job done. We're saying we'll keep an eye on this because... Energy prices are volatile at the moment. Um, there is a global battle against inflation in America, in Europe, everywhere. But no school child should go hungry in 21st century. I don't disagree with that. I was the, the minister 
when I was children, who introduced the holiday activities and food programme with Frank Field. We started with £10 million. Labour, yeah. Um, uh, Labour, absolutely right. Um, it's now running at £220 million a year, and we've got the funding for the next three years to continue to deliver holiday activities and food programme. We're coming into a holiday uh, period now. I'm very proud of the work we've done uh, on that. We continue to support. We've just announced free school meals for uh, children of parents with no recourse to public funds, um, which is important to make sure that... the that that child doesn't go hungry either. So we're doing a lot of work in this area, in the department. The important thing is education actually unlocks opportunity. You know, it's only when I began to think in the language, you know, I remember, I remember having mm. to learn and then you know, read and try and speak it as well as I can, when I started to think in the language. And the best thing I can do for children is make sure there's a great teacher uh, with a school that's strong and well-supported in a family of schools everywhere, from Knowsley to Kensington. I don't believe that a child in Knowsley is less talented than a child in Obviously Kensington, not. right? They just don't have the opportunity, yep. and I'm going to deliver that for them. OK. But you're a former vaccines minister. Why do you think it's appropriate uh, to stop you uh, having free lateral flow tests? So For NHS staff particularly. So uh, the Secretary of State for Health will say a bit more on this on the 1st uh, of April, uh, on what we're doing on testing. Um, the important thing to remember is, is we have to live with the virus. Our first line of defence is vaccine. He's already announced a, a further fourth jab for the most vulnerable uh, in society. But I'm talking about lateral flow. I, I, I hear you. The second line of defence is the um, therapeutics and the antivirals, which he's had the foresight, Sajid Javid, to buy those as well. Um, now, in some uh, parts of the economy where uh, we need to, to have further uh, work in terms of testing, he will say more on that. But actually, between vaccine and our radar system, the ability to genome sequence, I think we're in a strong place to now continue to live with the virus. We're going to have to live with it, I don't know for how long, maybe no, uh, you know, five, that. six, seven, ten years. But if people are going to um, um, elderly care homes or whatever, they need to have a test in order to go into that. Yes. That's £1,260 a year, something like that, is, is the average calculation. That's a tax on caring. Well, he's, he'll say more about um, what... Uh, will happen on uh, lateral flow devices on the 1st of April. But ultimately, we're going to have to live with this virus. It is through the vaccination programme that you're going to protect populations. It's great that, you know, the UK population now has very high levels of antibodies because of the vaccination programme, not just the, the one I was responsible for, but then the booster campaign where he delivered so brilliantly, Sajid Javid, and, of course, now the fourth jab and the antivirals and therapeutics, we have to get to a place, I think, where we transition this virus from pandemic to endemic. We're well on our way. We're probably the first major economy. I mean, just watching what's happening in China, you know, this idea where people had a sort of zero COVID yeah. strategy is clearly not working. It's a, you know, this is a virus that is aerosol transmitted. It is a respiratory virus. It's never going to work. The best thing you can do is protect the population through vaccination and then continue to make sure that the protection is there for the most vulnerable all the time. Um, and we're almost out of time, but I just wanted to know what you thought about what President Biden said. Um, did he misspeak um, on, at the weekend when he was talking about regime change in Russia? Well, both the White House and uh, the President have been clear on this. We are in lockstep with them. That is up to the Russian people to decide who governs them and the uh, future of their country. But he did uh, say he remain country. in power. Well, I hear you, but... Um, Do you back those words? Well, no, I, what I would say is up to the Russian people. I think the Russian people are pretty fed up, uh, not only because they're, they're watching their, you know, their friends, and some of them have family um, uh, in the Ukraine who've been attacked um, by the Putin uh, regime. You know, clearly, war crimes have been committed because they're targeting innocent um, uh, uh, civilians uh, in civilian areas. The Deputy Prime Minister is working with the International uh, Criminal Court to make sure that that evidence is in place. But I think President Biden is right to say that Putin has no place in the Ukraine. Uh, they have to make sure that they withdraw from Ukraine because it's an illegal invasion of the Ukraine. I think he's absolutely right in that. Ultimately, it's the Russian people who decide who governs them. Do you agree that he's a butcher? Well, I think there are war crimes that have been committed uh, in the Ukraine, no doubt, in my mind. The evidence is clear on that. It's right to collect that evidence because it's it's also important. You know, my family had experience with Saddam Hussein. Um, it's important that, that despots and dictators uh, understand that there will be a reckoning uh, 
um, and that reckoning will come through the International Criminal Court uh, in The Hague, as we've seen in Bosnia and, of course, in other parts of the world. It's really important. Um, this, this is not something that um, should be taken lightly, that, that you know, someone can um, go into a, 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 a country illegally uh, and start bombing civilians um, and, and feel that uh, there, there is no... Um, uh, there, there, there is no response from the global community. And mm. I think, uh, in many ways, the coming together of the world in this way has sent a very clear message to any dictator that they're not going to be able to get away, away with it in 2022. Yeah. Absolutely right. Um, it's great to see you, as great always. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you very much. Indeed.